Hi, this is Dr. C. Nice to see you all again. Today we're going to talk about something a little different. I talked about this about, I don't know, maybe two years ago. Um, didn't get many comments, but I think it did strike a tone. I'm going to talk about suicide in the COVID era. So we're going to bring in a little bit of the COVID stuff in addition to suicide. Now, why do I keep talking about suicide? Mainly because it is going up in numbers every year. And we need to talk a little bit about it. You need to understand a little bit about it. Maybe it'll help to prevent it. Maybe in you and a family member or someone you know. But regardless, we need to be totally educated about it and see what we can do, at least what we can do for prevention. What is suicide? It's the act of intentionally causing your death. Again, it's the act of intentionally causing your death. Now that's important. Every one of those words are important because we're going to talk about the act that's before the Massachusetts legislature this year as well. So remember that definition. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. 10th leading cause. You wouldn't think that's that bad, but it's the second leading cause of death in ages 18 to 25. In other words, there's a couple of peaks in number of suicides related to age. One peak is teenage years and early 20s. That's the first peak. The second peak is over 75, 80, in that range. Not as high, obviously, as the younger peak, but still significant. So, in 2018, we had over 48,000 deaths in the United States from suicide. And that's a low number because a lot of people don't put that onto a death certificate. Because there's this stigma about suicide. They don't want to put that into the, into the death certificate. And so, that's an underestimate of the number of people. And through a lot of surveys, et cetera, we found, and then looking at the people going into an emergency room in the United States, in 2018 again, there were 1.4 million, million attempts at suicide that presented in the emergency room. And when you really got into the survey stuff, Roughly about 10.6 million people in the United States thought about it for themselves, thought about suicide. They call that ideation, thinking about it. Never felt, well, most of them never followed through, but they thought about it. Okay. Generally speaking, the younger they are, the less successful they are because they tend to do stuff like overdosing, and, and women especially, overdosing or cutting. That's usually not successful in completion of the suicide. However, in the elder population, who I'm specifically talking to, men are more often attempting this than women. And they are much more successful than women because they use firearms, shooting, and they use hanging, suffocation, basically. So, and that is a much more accomplished way of suicide. So it's out there. Now in the SARS, they call it SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the, the virus now, SARS-CoV-2 which causes the epidemic COVID-19. 
that has some direct relationship now to suicide. Although everyone acknowledges that they're seeing more suicide now, I don't have the numbers yet because they're not published yet. But because of the isolation and the loneliness, because of the economic hardship caused by the COVID-19 epidemic, because of those, there should be, and there is, an increase, but we don't know the magnitude yet. So, going over again, all of the surveys that are done by people who have attempted, not just the thoughts, attempted suicide. What are the reasons that they give for having, to do, having done this? Well, first, they lost control, lost control of their health or finances. That's the big thing. And remember I said the uh, economic impact now is a big deal, as well as the isolation. So loss of control over their health or finances. Number two, loss of a loved one. That I can understand. Loss of independency. Fear that they are now becoming a burden not only on the family, but on society. They feel that they don't have the power to do anything about it anymore. They're powerless. No purpose in life. They get up in the morning, what do I have to do today? Nothing. Well, after day after day after day of having nothing to do, it gets very depressing. Depression is a major part of suicide. Loss of a former social contact or their social network. They no longer go to church. Remember, even with this epidemic that we're having, our brilliant leaders told us we can't go to church. That had a major impact on a lot of people, especially the elderly, because they're the ones that are usually going to church. And finally, loss of strong family ties. Families are all over the place now. And families are smaller. When I grew up, my family had 17 people. 17, which wasn't terribly unusual back then. I myself and my wife had, had three children and then adopted another seven. So we had 10 kids. Nowadays, if they have one or two, it's a major deal. So the numbers are going down. Marriages are going way down. And divorces are going up. So loss of family network is a big deal to the people who have gone on and tried to kill themselves. So let's look at all of those risk factors now. What would make someone stand out as a possible person who would commit suicide? Depression, as I mentioned, is number one. Depression. And there's a lot of depression now with the social isolation. Number two, chronic anxiety. Worried. People are worried. Am I going to get the disease? So chronic anxiety. People we know who have major psychiatric problems, like say bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. In other words, these are chronic major issues, psychiatric issues. They are up on that list of risk factors. People who substance abuse. A lot of people towards the end when they're they have that ideation, they're thinking about it, they start drinking more heavily or possibly using marijuana or one of the other psychoactive substances more heavily. People who have had previous attempts are definitely at risk. Veterans who have PTSD, don't discount that. PTSD is a major issue. And we are not well dealing with this. 
it needs to be dealt with with more aggressive therapy. You need to watch out for people who suddenly just drop out of society. They call it agoraphobia. They avoid a lot of outside contact. Then there's a term called anhedonia. What that means is that they take pleasure in nothing anymore. Nothing will turn them on. People who keep firearms in their house, sometimes for no reason, they just keep it. Well, I need it for protection, but they may never have used it. People with firearms in the house do get put on that risk list. People who have uncontrolled or intractable pain, and there are people who have that, and they are poorly treated. People who are recently handicapped, can't deal with it, lose a leg, bang. They lose it. They are in that risk category. Other red flags that we can see out there, people who actually make a statement. You know, I, I don't know if I can go on. I, I think it's just better if I just do myself in. They make a verbal statement, take it seriously. You need to talk to that person. Not to give them hell, no. You wanna to talk to them to establish a communication and an ongoing trust in you. If they told you this, that's the beginning of a little trust. Suddenly people who are self-isolating, I'd be very wary about them. When you see somebody start to give away a lot of their old prized possessions, been in a family for years. Here, take this, take this, take this. Why are they doing that? Maybe in the back of their mind they're thinking, I'm not going to need it where I go. So those are some, quotes, red flags that we have to be aware of. Now, <clears throat> we can have a positive influence on some of these people. How? Like I said, don't be judgmental. They may be going through some tough times. You need to establish a communication relationship. Just simply that relationship is a good thing in, the, in that person's life. And it needs to be ongoing. You just drop in, or pat them on the back, you're going to be okay and they don't see you again for a month, that's not ongoing communication. It needs to be regular. Never be judgmental, like I said. Try to establish some kind of social connection for that patient. No, come on with me sometime. Uh, we're going to go to this particular volunteer meeting. We need to go. Something you'd be interested in. In other words, try to establish a social connection for that patient. Now, if that patient is really serious, really serious, you need to give them a few phone numbers. Especially, you need to give them a phone number for the suicide prevention phone line. It's a 1-800-273-8255. Always an important number to remember. Also, you can call Elder Services here in the Worcester area. They can give you some of the local numbers for people who will assist with suicide prevention. Now, there is an entity, and I've seen this many times in town. It's called silent suicide. And what this is, and by definition, it's a masked intention to kill oneself by nonviolent means. You go into the house, stinks. They're obviously not taking care either of themselves or of their house. 
So it may be someone who's not taking the medication, and that medication may be essential. Diabetic, for example, I'm not taking that insulin anymore. So that is a form of silent suicide. They may do it by starvation. In other words, there's many different ways someone can injure themselves permanently and even silent suicide by omitting something in their lifestyle. So let's go on a little bit. I want to talk for a minute about two things. Number one, I had mentioned isolation. Isolation really is a form of loneliness. Loneliness. When they, again, have done surveys in the general population, they found that 46% of people feel that they're lonely. Not enough social connection. In fact, that's part of the definition, you might say, of loneliness. It's a sense of sadness. It's a sense of uneasiness because of that lack of social connection. That leads to depression, and depression can lead to suicide. So that's the connection, loneliness and suicide. So we all have to have this social connection. All of us do. Right from the time that there were original records, people would be banded together, either in groups, tribes, whatever you want to call it, we're social beings. And if you lose that social connectorship, that's when things begin to go downhill. You need to feel you belong to some group, that type of thing. So we tell people, well, join a club, learn a new skill. That is an excellent thing to, to try to get people to do. Learn a new skill. I don't care what the skill is. For example, if you know, I'm a retired doctor. Now, don't tell me to do doctoring as a skill, but maybe I want to try something different. I don't have great hand-eye coordination, but maybe I could learn a skill. Maybe I could even take a night course and learn a new skill. So, that's a good thing. You've got to create a schedule if you can. When you get up in the morning, I got to do this at this time, that at that time. That schedule is important. Now, we need to reduce our digital connection. I can't tell you, and I'm sure you know more about it than I do. I can't believe the number of hours that our young population is putting in with their damn phones or iPads. It's, it's amazing. Some of them can't even get their eyes off of the screen. They get addicted to games on their phone. Games. Now, it's one thing to play a game, but it's another thing to do it every day, hours on end. You need to get, reduce that digital footprint. Exercise. Try to get them to do some basic exercise. Like, for example, 10 o'clock every morning, I'm on. If you want something a little lighter, just before I come on, Karen McKenzie has her little exercise program as well. That's a little easier. I don't believe in easy. I want you to get the most out of it you can. And so that's why I have the exercise program. So exercise is very, very important. Also, don't give up shopping. Even with COVID out there, even with the virus out there, shop. Now you don't have to shop every day, once a week, once every whatever. You need to get out and do it locally. You're gonna see some people you know, and you're gonna reestablish that social connection when you go out. Volunteer. 
There's loads of different volunteer opportunities. A lot less now with COVID, unfortunately, but when it becomes available again, volunteer. And finally, there's nothing wrong with a pet. I'll tell you, I love my dog. And a lot of people love their animals. So don't cut the animals short. They are loving and they can really help with an individual who may have some ideation. Now I want to talk for a moment about the End of Life Options Act in Massachusetts. Originally, this was basically looking for assisted suicide. That failed. And so, year after year, this bill comes up before the legislature. Now, they avoid the word suicide in there. In fact, with this act now, End of Life Options Act, they say in the act itself that it is not suicide. Now, the legislature has absolutely no right and no intelligence, basically, to say that this is not suicide. Remember our original definition of suicide. It's an act of intentionally causing one's own death. So let me tell you a little bit about this end of life options. Why am I spending a little time on this? Because now, for the first time, first time, it finally passed the Joint Commission, the, the Joint Committee, House and Senate. It passed the Health Committee, Joint Committee. And now it's on to the finance part. And then once it passes through the finance part, it will come up before the general legislature. There is roughly about 10 states now that have this uh, right to die, basically, um, legislation. Ten of them have passed it already. And so basically what the people in this state are saying who are sponsoring this, and remember there's quite a few senators, I think something like uh, 20 senators and 46 or 47 um, of the House who are sponsoring this bill. So there's a big push. A lot of newspapers are coming out with editorials saying that this is a good thing. Well, let's talk about it a little bit. What do you have to do if you wanted to take your life and it's, quotes, not suicide? Before I talk about that, why is that important? Well, you, a lot of these people have life insurance. What do the life insurance companies say about it? They don't care what the legislators have said. What do they think? Well, there is a transition period. If you took that policy out within a year of committing this particular act, there's going to be some question. They're going to hold up payment to your heirs. Now, that interval, that one year, could be, in some states, up to two years. One to two years. That's that transition period. So there is some financial uh, question about that. So basically, if you're an individual who has, say, intractable pain, and you want, you're thinking seriously of this uh, so-called right to die, you have to give a verbal request. And then within about two weeks, you have to then submit a written request with two written witnesses. Then you have to have your diagnosis confirmed by two physicians, one your primary, one a second opinion. Then you need to have a psychiatric consult to say that you can make that decision rationally. Also, there has to be evidence that you have not been coerced. Nobody's twisting your arm to make this decision. 
All of your alternatives have to be explained. In other words, this isn't the only, only option that you have, and that has to be clearly spelled out. Also, there has to be an offer to withdraw. In other words, if you get that pill from the physician, and at the last minute you say, I don't really want to do this, you can do that. So you always have that, that option. You have to take the pill yourself. You can't have someone give it to you. You remember back when, uh, what was his name? Uh, Kervorkian, Dr. Death, they called him. He ran this little contraption and allowed the patient to pull the, th the switch so that it went on. <clears throat> uh, that was not a, a good thing he went to jail for. That was Dr. Death. And so, you know, these are the things you have to go through in order to abide by the regulations. So, at any rate, when I first talked about this, oh, like I said, two years ago, roughly, uh, I began be with, you remember MASH, Mobile Army? The, uh, this was a big deal, big uh, TV show, and uh, had a six, very successful run at, uh, uh, well, first it was the movie, and then a successful TV run after that. Their, their theme song was Suicide is Painless. And it was written by a son of the producer of the movie. In fact, he penned it off in one night. Very uh, rapidly done. And it became a theme song. <coughs> Suicide is Painless. Well, nowadays, you know, with all of the provisions that we have in place for that supposed options act that is going to be before the legislature and all, um, these are things that uh, are really right up to date. And you need to know about these things and the things that you can do to help to prevent this from happening. And I hope that you would look at the people in your community and see if any of these risk factors are present. The, uh, even in, uh, in Shrewsbury, that uh, Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services ran a little study uh, finding out what the problems are that the elderly are complaining about. The very first thing, which I told them to, isolation definitely right up at the top. Loneliness. So this is Dr. C. And it's been very nice talking to you. I hope you take this seriously. And next time we'll have a more pleasant subject. Thank you and have a nice day.